All right, church, anybody ready for God's word today? Man, I hope you're hungry and you're ready for God's word today. And I pray that the word of God is the foundation of, of your life. The mission of discovery is to lead people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And there's no way that that can be accomplished but, but through the power of God's word in us. He reveals himself to us. He speaks truth and breathes life into us through his words. So I pray, man, you're jacked. I pray to, that you're ready for God's word. I want to invite you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings is found in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 18. We kicked off the series last week and we pressed it on this truth that God has to do a work in you before he can do a work through you. God has to do a work in you before he can do a work through you. And we kicked off the series in chapter 17. Chapter 17, we're looking throughout the entirety of the series at the life of Elijah, the life of Elijah. And Elijah, there's three root words that make up Elijah. My God, Jehovah. My God, Jehovah. My God, Jehovah. And so Elijah, his God was the creator, was the one true and living God. Elijah was a man of God who spoke on behalf of God. Elijah was an Old Testament prophet that, that prophesied in the northern part of Israel. And so he was a man of God who spoke on behalf of God. Uh, Old Testament prophets were used by God to call the, the people of Israel back to God, to call the Call, call repentance in, to call the, your eyes have wandered away from the one true and living God and, and they're starting to stray on false gods. And so come back to the one true and living God. And so Elijah was used by God in that capacity. Elijah is mentioned 28 times in the New Testament. 28 times uh, throughout the New Testament, Elijah is mentioned. Now he was an ordinary man through whom God accomplished extraordinary things. He was an ordinary man. Elijah was a man just like you and just like me, but God used him in such a way to accomplish extraordinary things. And so chapter 17, what we discover is that in verse 1 of chapter 17, uh, the Lord says, go speak to King Ahab. Now, King Ahab was the 19th, get that, the 19th consecutive evil king. That's what chapter 16 and verse 30 tells us, 1 Kings 16 verse 30, that King Ahab was the 19th consecutive evil king, and he was the, the, the worst of all 19. And so the Lord tells Elijah, go to King Ahab and speak this, this word to King Ahab, that there's a drought coming. There's a drought, a severe drought coming. And, and what, what does that mean? What, what does that mean for that time? That means it's an economic shutdown. That means uh, people aren't going to have water to drink. Uh, uh, the, 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 the crops will not pr produce. And so people are going to starve. Animals are going to starve. And it's going to be a terrible time. Now, if you're the most powerful ruler of, of, of the time, how excited would you be to, to hear that word come uh, and, and come from someone else? And on top of it, Elijah said, uh, there's not going to be any water until my command. Now, could you just imagine being King Ahab, the most powerful ruler, and some guy comes to you and says, hey, guess what? We're shutting this whole thing down and, and, and until my command, uh, when I give the go, the rain's coming back. I mean, can you just imagine? So King Ahab is, 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 is angry, angry at Elijah. So the Lord tells him in chapter 17 to go back to, 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 go, to, Zer, uh, to, go to the Kareth Brook located in, in the Jordan Valley. He says, run eastward, head eastward in chapter 17. Go to the Kareth Brook in the Jordan Valley. And, and, and something special happened in that valley. Most of us don't see see the valley experience as something special. We want to avoid the valley experience because in the valley, a valley is a place of isolation. It's a place of desolation. It, it's, it's a place of battles. And, and most of us, we don't, we don't like the valley experience. Can we just be honest today? Most of us like, get me to the good stuff. I only want to celebrate the good things. Uh, but, but here's the deal. God does something special inside of us. He changes us. He shapes us. He, he does a work in, in, inside of us. He did a work inside of Elijah as he was sent to the Kareth Brook in the Jordan Valley. And so what we discover in chapter 17 is Elijah, he experiences pain. How many of you like pain? But pain is necessary for growth. Can we just, can we just agree to that? We don't like pain, but uh, as I said last week, man, in the gym, if there's no pain, there's no gain. And so, so you know what I'm saying? Uh, there, there's no, there's no uh, growth. Pain is, 
in the process is necessary for personal growth. It's, it's absolutely necessary for personal growth. And, and in fact, we, we spend so much time questioning God of the pain that we're experiencing rather than saying, God, how are you going to use this? What are you doing inside of me for your glory and honor? So Elijah, he faces this isolated pain. And in the valley, we face pain. And, and if we allow it to, the pain, here's what happens. The pain leads us to total dependence upon God. Pain leads us to total dependence on God. Listen, we were, we were created to totally depend on God. How many of you think you got it all figured out? And there's times that, can we just agree? There's times we, we, we now we might not verbalize it, but through our actions, we verbalize it, that we don't need you, God, and I'll call you when I need you. Hey, anybody else other than me? Okay, thank you. And, and so there's times in our lives that we're just like, man, we just don't need it. But, but the isolated, the pain in that process leads us to total dependence on creator God. Creator God, total dependence. And so the total dependence leads us to unconditional obedience. And I pray that you'll experience what I'm talking about here. The pain that you're going through, listen, is, is temporary. Hear me, it's temporary. And if we allow God, God will reveal himself in ways he's, he's never experienced himself through the pain. That leads to total dependence on God. And that total dependence saying leads us to unconditional obedience. And so we see in chapter 17 that the, the Lord told Elijah, all right, it's time to, to leave. It's time to leave. Head to Zarephath. Head to Zarephath. Turn to the person that you let, let him know. Zarephath is where Elijah went. Zarephath. Just say the word with me. It's fun. Zarephath. 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 Okay, we're all there. And, and so it's in Zarephath that God uses him in, in some pretty supernatural ways. Like there's this widow that just wants to give up and die. And, and God sends Elijah. How many of you are thankful for the Elijahs that God has sent in your life? The moment you felt at your weakest, you, you felt isolated, you felt like no one cared, and God sent an Elijah to you. So he's in Zarephath, and God uses Elijah in some powerful ways to make the glory of God known. And then we find in chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, that the Lord says, You've been here long enough. It's time to move on. In fact, I'm calling you back to King Ahab. I want you to go back to King Ahab, and, and I want you to let him know that the rain is about to come. And, and what we read in the first part of chapter 18, what we discover in the first part of chapter 18, is that, it, it, that the, the drought had gotten so severe that King Ahab turned to Obadiah. Now, I know there's a couple different names, so just bear with me. Obadiah was in charge of the palace and all this is written down, by the way, in chapter 18. And so you're like, I don't know, how can I keep it? Just go to chapter 18 with me. And so Obadiah was in charge of the palace, but Obadiah was a God-fearing man. Can you imagine? I mean, some of you think you work with some evil people, and, uh, but, but like the worst of 19 kings, uh, and, and Obadiah was sent by God for, for, for such a time. Obadiah, a God-fearing man. King Ahab says, hey, the severe so drought, our animals... The, the few that we have left are, are, are going to die unless we find some water. And so he says, I'm going to go search for water on this side of the kingdom. You go search for water on this side of the kingdom. And so King Ahab goes to this side. Obadiah goes to this side. And guess who Obadiah runs into as he's searching for water? Elijah. Elijah being obedient to the Lord, going to King Ahab to say, hey, guess what? The water is coming back, but not before God uses me to call his people back to himself. So Obadiah says, no, no, you can't go to King Ahab. King Ahab has searched all over the kingdom for you. He wants you. And not like, it, not like to shake his hand, not like to give him a, you know, one of those bro hugs, nothing like that. It was, no, he wanted him dead. I, he wanted him dead. He's, he's, he's angry at Elijah. So Obadiah tries to talk Elijah out of it. But, but what I love about this is Elijah says, no, 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 you can talk all you want. But listen, the Lord has spoken and I, I must simply obey God. I have to obey God. No matter if my, no matter if I die, no matter the consequences, I, I got to obey God. So after the, the exchange, Elijah continues on to meet King Ahab. And so we pick up the story. We pick up the story in, in verse 17. Uh, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is that you, the one ruining Israel? I love those words. Just think about that for a minute. 
Other translations read, is that you, the troublemaker, the troublemaker of Israel, right? Is that you ruining Israel? Can you, can you imagine, like, how is this going to go? How is this conversation? This is going to be a great conversation, right? I mean, the first thing that's spoken, is that you, the guy that's ruining Israel? I mean, can you just imagine with me? I, I, I man, I, I got to be honest, you know, the, the, the sweat would begin to build at this moment. Uh, and, and, and so uh, I love Elijah's boldness, though. Where does he get his boldness? It comes from the Lord, his, his God. And, uh, and he just simply replies, I have not ruined Israel. <laughs> what does he say? Verse 18, you have ruined Israel. Man, I didn't ruin Israel. You and your family have ruined Israel. From your wickedness, from your evil, you've ruined Israel. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and followed the, the Baals. You followed the false gods and abandoned the one true and living God. Verse 19, now, now summon all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Jezebel's King Ahab's wife, just in case you, you're wondering. So he says, hey, we're going to settle this once and for all, man. Meet me at Mount Carmel, right? Mount Carmel. Meet me at Mount Carmel. There's going to be a contest. Gather all the false prophets, and we're going to see who serves the one true and living God. God. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. You with me? You with me so far? Verse 20 here, uh, Ahab gathers all the false prophets. He gathers all the children of all the Israelites. He gathers them all on, on Mount Carmel. Listen, we're pressing on this truth today that, that, that we experience God intimately in the valley to trust him completely on the mountain. Don't you hear that today? I want to encourage you to write that down and consider it, pray through it. And we experience God intimately in the valley to trust him completely on the mountain. And so, some of you, you, you're thinking, man, I've made it through the valley and, 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 and um, now I'm on the mountain and, and it's a, just going to be a complete celebration. And then you get to the mountaintop and you're like, whoa, God, I didn't sign up for this thing. I was expecting a party. You got to do another work? I want you to know today, listen, I want you to hear this today, that the same God that was with you in the valley is the same God that is with you on the mountain. Listen, the same God that fought for you in the valley is the same God that's going to fight for you on, on the mountain. The, the victory belongs to him. The victory belongs to him. We experience God intimately in the valley to trust him completely on the mountain. Look at verse 21, 1 Kings 18, verse 21. Then Elijah approached all the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? So all the people, I mean, are you with me? Are you with me on this? Uh, they're on Mount Carmel, the top of Mount Carmel. Uh, 850 false God, or false prophets. All the Israelites gathered on top of Mount Carmel. And he says, Elijah says to him, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, but if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. So everyone gathers on top of Mount Carmel. Elijah says, it's time to stop wavering. It's time to stop wavering. See, at this point, Israel had totally rejected the Lord. They had totally rejected the Lord. They were trying to combine the, the worship of Jehovah with the worship of Baal. They're trying to combine the worship. And here in this moment, here is what I consider the Martin Luther of old time Israel, who single-handedly challenged the whole priesthood of the state religion. Martin Luther, we know Martin Luther, he's reading through Ephesians, he's a Catholic priest one day, and he's reading through Ephesians, he's like, whoa, we've been doing this whole thing wrong. We've been trusting in our works, but it's all about the grace of God. So what does he do? He nails the 95 thesis on the Catholic door. He's excommunicated because of his stance upon God's word and the grace of God is sufficient for salvation. And Elijah's making that same bold proclamation. He's making that, that, that proclamation in this moment saying, choose today who you will serve. Stop wavering between the two. Trust God fully or trust the false gods fully. You make the decision today. Look at verse 22, verse 22. Then Elijah said to the people, I am the only remaining prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. How would you like to be the only 
one standing. How many times do you feel like you're the only one standing? You feel like, is there anyone else standing with me? Elijah, full of boldness because he knew without a doubt that his Lord was present with him and empowering him to accomplish what he had called him to. He says, I'm the only one remaining. Verse 23, let, let two bulls be given to us. They are to choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and place it on the fire, but not light the fire. I will prepare the other bull and place it on the wood, but not light the fire. Then you call in the name of the, the name of your God and I will call in the name of the Lord. The God who answers with fire, he is God. All the people answered, that's fine. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, since you are so numerous, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first. Then call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. Did you see what's happening here? This contest is, is happening here on Mount Carmel. And I love the fact that Elijah says, you know what, man, I don't, I don't need to go first. You go first. You try your way because I know what, who my God is. I know my God is going to come through. I trust God completely. Verse 26, so they took the bull that he gave them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal. From morning until noon, saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no sound. No one answered. Then they danced around the altar they had made. At, Elijah, uh, at noon, Elijah mocked them. Verse 27, he said, shout loudly, for he's a, for he's a God. Maybe he's thinking it over. Maybe he's, he's wandered away. Maybe he's on the road. Perhaps he's sleeping and will wake up. They shouted loudly, cut themselves with knives and spears according to their custom until blood gushed over them. All afternoon, they kept on raving until the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no sound. Don't miss this. There was no sound. There was no sound. No one answered. No one paid attention. There was no sound. No one answered. And no one paid attention. Quite possibly this is what I would consider the first recorded rave in history happening on top of Mount Carmel. I mean, they're doing everything that they can to get their God moving, to get their God to speak, to get their God to show up. Have you ever been in that place where you're, I mean, you're just running around, you're just going nuts and insanity is starting to set in. You're going, I don't got anything else in me. These people, man, they, they, they're giving it all they got. But at the end, don't miss it. At the end, there was no sound. No one answered. No one paid attention. There was no response. Listen, church, today, a false gods promise what only the true God provides. False gods promise what only the true God provides. False gods promise a, a false love, a false hope, a, a false joy, a false peace, a false comfort, a false strength. How many times you, you, you set out, Lord, you know, I, I need some strength, so I'm going to go look for it here. I need some love, so I'm going to look for it here. I need some peace. I'm going to look for it here. I need joy in my life. I, I'm going to look for it, for it here. And we've looked in all the other places rather than the, the one true and living God. False gods promise what only the true God provides. False gods promise what only the true God provides. Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. One of my favorite scriptures in, in all of the word of God. Now, now may the, the God that, that is the source of hope fill you with joy and peace. I wonder what you need today. Do you need some joy? Do you need some peace? I mean, everywhere we, we, we go uh, in this time, what, what do we see? We, we see joy to the world. We see peace on earth. And, 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 and we're thinking, oh, I need that. Search no further than the one true and living God who offers it today. He promises hope, joy, peace, power. Philippians 4, 13, I am able to do all things, all things through him who strengthens me. What, what, what is it that, 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 that you are facing? What, what challenge or circumstance that, 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 you are, 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 that is in front of you? What area are you lacking? And you need, 
You need a supernatural strength. You, you've given to this thing and you've given to this thing and you've given to this thing and I can't do it anymore on my own, God. So I'm going to look to you. What if that would begin to be our first response rather than our last resort? God, I need you. I need your strength daily in my life. Gotta fill me up. Thank you that I can accomplish all that you've called me to accomplish because it's you who puts the power in me. You know, literally translated, that, that's what strengthens me means. Literally translated, he puts the power in us. Are you a follower of his today? Are you a child of the most high today? Listen, you have all the strength that you need to continue to face the challenge that is in front of you. And strength is found in the Lord, in the Lord our God. Look at verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near me. I love those words, dude. Don't miss this. After they did all their song and dance and, and, and all their shouting and bloods everywhere. I mean, listen, the fire didn't show up. I love this. Elijah said to, to all the people, come near me. I believe Elijah is able to speak those words, come near me, because he has experienced the nearness of God. He has experienced the nearness of God. And so just imagine all of that just happened. All of that just transpired. And what does he say? All right, you've had your chance. There's no response, no sound, no movement. Come on over. Come near, near me. Get, get in close. Come on close. So all the people approached him. Then he repaired the Lord's altar that had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel will be your name. And he, re and he built an, an altar with the stones in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold about four gallons. Could you just imagine in that moment what the people that are watching him, that are close by, what, what are you doing? You're building this altar and now you're digging a trench? Uh, we don't understand what's going on. Next, he arranged the wood, cut up the bull, placed it on the wood. He said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the offering to be burned on the wood. Then he said a second time. And they did it a second time. I can just imagine the People looking at him like, you're crazy. What is going on in this moment? Then he said, it not a, uh, a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar. He even filled the trench with water. In this moment, Elijah is saying, come on near me. Uh, look at this trench. Pour all the water on. Why? Because he wants the people to know that his God is present. That his God is about to, about to pour down, about to, <clears throat> to light that altar with fire. At the time, verse 36, at the time for offering the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that at your word I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord, answer me so that this people will know that you, the Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the Lord's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell face down and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I love Elijah's prayer. In this particular moment, he didn't need a song. He didn't need a dance. He didn't need shouting. He didn't need anything. Just a simple cry from his heart to the Lord, his God. And he says, answer me so that this people will know that you, the Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Answer me, he says. Answer me, Lord. I wonder, again, what is our first response when the challenge of life comes and it just seems to be completely overwhelming? What is our first response typically? Our first response is just to tell the whole world how much life just sucks and, and again, no, no, you know, just vent it all out there, put it all out there. And I wonder, what would it look like? And if our first response was, Lord, God, answer me. In this moment, 
in this moment, give me the strength that I need. Give me the grace that I need. Give me the wisdom that I need. Lord, I am seeking your face. Answer me so that all may know that you are God. Lord, my heart's desire is for you to receive all the glory and honor from my life. And somehow, some way, make yourself known. See, listen, God was with Elijah in the valley. God was with Elijah on the mountain. I want you to know today, wherever you find yourself, God, God is with you in the valley. If you're on a mountain, God is with you on the mountain. Your mountain may not be a mountain of celebration, as I said a moment ago. It, it, it may be a challenging mountain. I want you to know that God is with you, that God is present with you. I want you to know that according to 1 John 4, 4, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I want you to know that we are more than conquerors, that we are victorious because of Christ Jesus in us and through us. I want you to know today that the enemy might be trying to, to, to cause fear to, to run and rule your life. But I want you to know that the spirit of the living God brings power. He brings power for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of, but of power. I want you to hear that today, a supernatural power. Listen, it is time to stop wavering and it's time to start worshiping. I want to say that again. It is time to stop wavering between the two opinions here. And it's time to start worshiping the one true and living God. It is time to stop stressing and it's time to start serving. It's time to stop the pity party and it's time to start the praise party. It's time to start living. It's time to start forgiving. It's time to start moving forward and trusting God that he is absolutely 100% in control of this life. It's time. Now's the time. And Elijah on that mountaintop, you know, before he could experience the supernatural provision of God, he, he had to make a bold statement as he's facing these 850 false prophets. And all the, all the children of Israel that had turned their backs on God, don't miss this. He had to walk through that challenge before he could celebrate. And, and, and where you're at today, where I'm at today, listen, we, we have to walk through the challenge, but not walk alone. We have to trust God completely. Trust God completely that he's going to see you through. I wonder if you trust him today completely. We can experience God intimately in the valley to trust him completely on the mountain. Listen, as we, as we begin to close, I, I want you to hear this. Only the living present God keeps his promises. There's going to be a lot of people and a lot of things that, that fail you. But only the living present God keeps his promises. You, you're saying, well, Tim, how, how do you know that? How can you be so sure and have such a confidence that the living present God keeps his promises? Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, we closed last week with it. We're going to close this week with it. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, we see these words, see the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is, is with us. I'm so thankful for this scripture. Now listen. Only the living, present God keeps his promises. This scripture was a prophecy that we read about in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This scripture that came to fruition at the birth of Christ was given some 700 years prior to Jesus coming. God always keeps his promises. It might not be in your time and it might not be in my time, but we can trust God because he keeps his promises. Only the living, present God keeps his promises. Stop listening and looking to the false gods and start listening and looking to the one true and living God. This Christmas season, point people, point people to the living God, to the source of all hope, all peace, all joy, all power. Point 
to the one who will never fail. The greatest thing we can do this, this season. But it starts with you, it starts with me. Choosing today. The guy, the challenges of this life and the brokenness of life, they're gonna keep on coming. But one by one, I'm gonna continue to trust you completely. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes all over this place? And would you just say, Lord, what is my response today? What is my response today? Would you allow God to speak to you? Would you allow God to change your heart? Your attitude, your perspective? Just say, Lord, I trust you completely. As people are praying all over this place, if there's someone here that you've never surrendered over to Jesus, could today be the day that changes everything? And you would say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but today I trust in you to forgive me of all my sins. I believe that Jesus came to this earth, that he died on a cross. He was placed in a grave and he rose victorious. That that's the gospel. And that was done for a sinner like me. And so today I thank you, Jesus, I thank you. I confess that you are Lord. I'm no longer boss of my life, you are boss. I trust you completely. And I thank you for saving me. I thank you for saving me. If that's your prayer today, I want you to know that the greatest decision you could ever make is to follow Jesus. Because in Jesus is, again, the, the peace that you're longing for, the joy that you're longing for, the hope that you're longing for, the love that you're longing for. Everything that you're longing for and in need of is found in, in Christ. It's found in Christ. Trust him completely. And so, Lord, we, we just say thank you for how good and great you are. Thank you for your word today. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you that you are, you are present here. You are, and as we leave this place, you're present with us. You're walking with us, giving us everything that we need to live on mission for you. And so, Lord... We celebrate you today and forevermore. And now we just, we continue to worship you. We, we take a step out of faith to worship you through the tithes and offerings. So be glorified in our, in our lives. And it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to worship God through, through giving of tithes and offerings. This is the time that we just say, thank you, Jesus, for how you supply all of my needs. I trust you. I take a step of faith to, to trust you. I want to honor you. You can go to weirddiscovery.co. There's a giving link. You can click on that. We made it pretty easy, and it's safe. You can go there, weirddiscovery.co. You can also, in the lobby, there's a giving kiosk. You can go see our giving kiosk. That's right in our lobby. Those are different ways that we can honor the Lord through giving of the tithes and offerings. Hey, this week's been a big week in the life of Discovery. As we close, I just want to share a few things with you this week. Uh, Tuesday was called Giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday was this week. And, and so last Sunday, I kind of just shared just quickly, kind of a soft launch. And today's kind of continuation of the soft launch. Build This Home campaign. Build This Home campaign. And, and so the first piece of the campaign was Giving Tuesday, with it being the first Tuesday in December. And so we had a Facebook fundraiser. And I just want to thank those that participated, those that gave, those that prayed, those that invited people to it, those that shared it. 
Man, God is so good. He's faithful. Amen. We raised over just $5,000, over $5,000 on Tuesday, on Giving Tuesday, right on Facebook. And so we praise God. We're able to use leverage technology for his glory. And uh, so we just thank God for that. And uh, yesterday, yesterday I, I joined a couple people out at the property at 8.30. I want to invite you to come every Saturday at 8.30. Every Saturday at 8.30, we're praying at the property. There's going to be someone there to pray at the property at 8.30 as a group. And so I want to just invite you to come out and join us. Yesterday, we were out there. It was kind of a last-minute quiet thing. So I stepped out there, and I was just encouraged to see the progress of all the, the boards have been formed, and, and we're one step closer to pouring concrete and uh, getting the footers poured and all those things as the building arrives January 6th. It's coming quick. And so we just praise God for his goodness, for his faithfulness. I, I took a picture on the what's going to be the stage, where the stage is, and, and just celebrate God's goodness and, and how he's going to provide everything that we need in advance. So with that being said, December 23rd, December 23rd is it's a Monday, and it's Christmas Eve Eve. Tell the person next to you it's Christmas Eve Eve. Not Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve Eve, right? Something different. We are going to celebrate the birth of Christ right here at 7 p.m. on Monday, Christmas Eve Eve. And uh, I want to encourage you to invite your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors. Who invite them? Invite them all. Invite everybody. There's invite cards all throughout the lobby. Take stacks of them and, and get the word out about Christmas Eve Eve. We're going to put on every chair that we have. We're putting out taking that back wall down, pushing it back. It's going to be a great time of worship. There, It's going to be a family worship experience, family style, meaning there's no kids' environments. It's the one time a year that, uh, that we're going to worship together. Our, our children have been practicing a song to sing with the band that night, and so that, that's going to be a really cool thing. They're going to be singing with the band, and um, we're going to have a little candle lighting and uh, sing some Christmas songs hear a word, it's going to be an encouraging time. That's Christmas Eve Eve. In addition to all of that that's happening on Christmas Eve Eve, we're going to be taking up a special Christmas offering, a special Christmas offering. So if you missed Giving Tuesday, or even if you, you made Giving Tuesday, or whichever way, we're going to be taking up a one special offering on Christmas Eve Eve. It's our Christmas offering, and 100% of it is going to the next chapter to the building campaign to build this home, 100% of it. And so I would just ask you, Discovery, to pray. Just say, Lord, what should should we give? What should our our, our family give to this special Christmas offering? And, and here's the deal. This is above and beyond. At the 22nd, it's our regular tithes and offering that goes to the, the general budget of Discovery. That's on a Sunday. But this Monday, the one offering is going 100% to the, the next chapter. So I would just ask you to pray, Lord, what should we give as a family? What should we bring to give and trust you in it? Trust you in it. So, uh, hey, next week, week three of Is God With You? Invite somebody, bring somebody, and it's going to be a powerful worship experience. God bless you.